The real estate industry is the world's single largest contributor to climate change. At Fifth Wall, we're on a mission to help the industry eradicate its carbon emissions and build to zero. Well, Greg, thank you so much for coming in. Uh, where are you coming in from? I'm uh, coming in from Oakland. Uh, it's a nice sunny day. Uh, thanks for having me. Of course. Um, and Greg, maybe can you just start with your professional background and in particular, your professional passion around climate tech and sustainability and like where that started, where that gestated in your career? Yeah, so I'll kind of work backwards um, and then that'll get to where the gestation really, really came from. So. Um, at the moment, I'm coming most, most recently from BMW's iVentures, where I actually um, started and built up uh, what we call the sustainable investing practice. Um, and this was really around how do you decarbonize manufacturing and supply chain and transportation, um, which are you know, three of the largest greenhouse gas emitting um, uh, parts of the world. Um, and before that, I worked um, reporting directly into Elon at both the Boring Company and at Neuralink. Um, at the same time, and uh, that was a little bit of a wild ride, right? You know, two jobs at the same time for a guy who, if there's a space rocket launch at three in the morning, like the workday has started. Um, so yeah, I had a little bit more hair before I started doing that. Um, and then before that, I was at Battery Ventures. Um, and if you aren't familiar with Battery Ventures, it's a large fund that is stage and vertical agnostic. Um, and so I was lucky enough there to do um, a lot of industrial tech deals. Um, and that really plays into how I originally really got into this space and the passion, which is um, I'm South African and I come from a very uh, sort of large industry uh, there around mining and industrial tech. Um, my dad actually uh, designs explosive systems for the mines. And uh, my first job out of high school was in um, an ammonium nitrate explosives plant. Um, and so when I've been looking at this, uh, looking at climate tech, I think I've, I've been seeing the problems for so many years, right? Today we're seeing wildfires and in Cape Town, we were running out of water last year. Um, and so I've seen this as a problem, but then the question is how do you solve that? Um, and I've just been very fortunate to have a very interesting background here where you take deep tech and industrial tech type things and you smush them together and that actually is climate tech, right? You're looking at big industrial processes, you're looking at chemistry, you're looking at physics, uh, things like that, which um, a lot of people in the venture industry don't necessarily have as their background. Um, and I'm just for I'm very fortunate to actually have had that experience uh, all through my career. Um, and I think the time is right now for us to be able to take, you know, big industrial processes, big chemistry, deep tech, um, and throw some money at it to actually uh, solve, frankly, the biggest moonshot um, opportunity that humanity has ever had. So interesting to hear kind of that, that career arc. And I, I'm particularly interested in your last experience at, at BMW because, you know, one of the interesting things about what we're doing, obviously, in, in climate tech for the built world, which we'll talk more about, is, is that it's not intuitive to people that the real estate industry is so contributive to climate change, um, meaning the, the magnitude of that contribution is just a priori not obvious to people. However, in the automotive industry, it is. I think everyone has for a long time thought of the automotive industry and transportation broadly as being highly contributive to climate change. I guess, what was that experience like and what were the technologies that you looked at and how did BMW think about kind of blending the opportunity around the financial return and you know, structuring the future of their business with kind of the ethical imperative to decarbonize and reduce emissions from automobiles. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly spot on that. In, in transportation, people see this connection to greenhouse gases. Um, pretty, it's pretty obvious, right? Tail, tailpipe emissions, like you can often see them. I don't know if you've ever been, uh, had a, a someone roll coal on you um, with their big uh, diesel truck, right? Um, so I think on the surface, people think, oh, transportation, we completely understand that you can decarbonize that. But actually what I found most interesting is that um, the automotive industry just thought, okay, fine, well, let's go and um, make electric cars and then we've solved this. Um, 
but that's only a very small slice of the problem, right? It's uh, you actually also need a clean grid so that you aren't just transferring coal powered electricity into your cars, right? So you need a clean grid. Um, and then you also want those cars themselves to actually be clean when you're manufacturing them. Um, and so for example, the average car has got about 300 pounds of plastic in it. All of that plastic releases a whole ton of greenhouse gases when they go and do the naphtha, uh, naphtha cracking um, in the petrochem industry to go and make that plastic. Or the steel takes a ton of fossil fuel energy to make that steel, right? And so the actual tailpipe emissions are only a very small percentage of the total problem. And um, I find this very similar to um, what's happening in the built world environment, where people might think like, oh, well, we put some solar panels on the roof, therefore we've solved this problem. And it turns out like, no, actually the emissions that come from the energy portion of it are only a very small percentage of the total. Um, and so what I found um, in the sustainability and climate impact deals I was doing at BMW was, um, I actually didn't do a lot around electrification of vehicles because that kind of piece of the puzzle was what everybody else was chasing after, right? Instead, I spent most of my time looking at the rest of the problem. What is the embodied carbon in that car that came off the road? How do you make clean steel? How do you make clean plastic? Um, how do you take a supply chain where, you know, a typical car has anywhere from 50,000 to 100,000 parts in it? Um, and each one of those parts is coming from a different factory in a different part of the world. Um, often one nut or bolt will have traveled um, the equivalent of four or five times around the world before it actually makes it into your car because it's going back and forth between different um, parts of the supply chain. And so actually I was looking at the bigger picture here, which is the supply chain, the things that go into the vehicles that account for a very significant portion of the greenhouse gases. And that's exactly what I see in um, the built world environments where a lot of the industry thinks that they kind of check the box here by saying, hey, we put some solar panels on the roof or we improve the insulation on our windows. Um, but they're really ultimately just hitting a small portion of the total impact. And there's a massive rest of the pie that we actually have to go after in all of the embodied carbon here. Um, yeah, and then when it comes to actually the that balance of the ethics versus the uh, financial payoff is I think even just five years ago, a lot of these decisions of should I build something in a greenhouse gas efficient way or a, a carbon neutral way, uh, it really was just an ethical decision because it was so much more expensive to do it that way. But what's happened in roughly the last four years, four or five years, is the price of the clean energy going into a lot of chemical processes has just fallen off of a cliff. Um, you know, we've seen the, the price and the levelized cost of energy of wind and solar coming down to a point where it's actually cheaper to build new solar farms than it is to simply run an existing coal power station. And the reason why that's important is all of a sudden, a bunch of chemical processes that previously you would only do because of ethics now actually are cheaper to do if you do them in a green way. And that's when the rest of the world should wake up because the economics is really starting to make sense here. Um, and you can make lots of money doing these things now. So you don't actually necessarily have to have this trade-off that a lot of people thought was the case before. And what's interesting also is when you think about kind of the ethics, right, of sustainability and the imperative to decarbonize, you know, one part of that is at a federal level or at a corporate responsibility level. But then there's another dimension to it, which is on the demand side. And what's interesting about automobiles is that, you know, consumers do think, they, they know that when you buy a Prius, that is better for the environment. That is a walking advertisement for the owner of that car's commitment to sustainability, right? There is a, there is a message sent through that. And I was thinking about what you said that, you know, you can see the emissions coming out of a car's tailpipe. And I think about like a cold day in New York, like if you've ever been high up in a building and you look out over New York on a cold day, you see all this steam and it look, just looks like yeah. emissions. You're yeah. like, okay, that's clearly bad for the environment. And that's obviously very intuitive and very visual and very visceral. Um, but at the same time, it's the embodied carbon in a building that has such a huge impact on it. And I guess my question is, do you think we're starting to see a shift where the demand for real estate from tenants themselves, whether that's companies that are leasing office space or leasing industrial space, um, or tenants of a multifamily building or buyers of homes are starting to ask questions because they see their home or their building 
as an embodiment of their personal ethical commitment to sustainability. Meaning, what if, is what happened in the automobile industry, right, where buying a Prius was a statement, a personal statement for the individual. Is that going to also happen in the real estate industry where the kind of office I occupy, the kind of home I live in, the kind of multifamily building you know, I live in, those say something about my personal ethical commitment to sustainability? Yeah, absolutely. I think you actually have to think of it as uh, there's an interrelation here between brands um, and the consumers that they're selling to. And those brands then are tenants inside buildings and um, they need to go and make demands on their, um, on their landlords, for example. I think you're, you're absolutely right. And what it is, is an interplay between brands and the consumers who want to buy those brands. Um, and then those brands then turning around and saying to their landlords, we demand better buildings because of it. And, and let me really nail this down with, uh, with some good examples. Um, so if I'm, for example, Whole Foods, right? I've built a lot of my brand around organic food, around being good for the environment. And I'm advertising to my end consumers with all of that in my messaging, right? And then in return, my consumers are voting with their wallets by buying from me because they believe that I embody that point of view. If now all of a sudden it comes out that Whole Foods uh, buildings are you know, not efficient, they're spewing uh, greenhouse gases, right? That's not gonna look good for Whole Foods. It's so interesting because I think a lot of people don't think of the real estate, uh, the real estate industry as being a supplier to any given industry, but it yep. is, right? Definitely. It's a supply to every industry. <laughs> yeah, it, the, the US economy happens indoors, right? It yep. happens under a roof. And as a function of that, real estate is a massive supplier. Like you take Amazon, right? Amazon has had, this very public commitment to decarbonize its business. And you think about, okay, what's the supply chain of Amazon delivering what they deliver to the consumer? And it's data centers, warehouses, yeah. intermodal yeah. facilities, office buildings, now retail stores. And you're right, like those leases are being signed today that will be in effect for potentially decades. Um, yeah. And I guess th that brings me to my next question, which is, you know, when you first thought about this concept of, decarbonizing the built world, right? And kind of the, almost the structural shortfall in how much capital is being, inv being invested into the technologies that can competently decarbonize the built environment. What attracted you to that? Like what was interesting about that thesis to you given your experience? So I always start my, my venture investment theses with just a general size of market question, right? And I think this is sort of like venture capital 101. You start with, with a large market um, and then something that is changing that market, some pressure that is forcing that market to have to change and adopt a new technology. Um, and then you can go through all of these different markets. And I think it's really interesting, like all of the big venture capital funds you've ever heard of, Sequoia, Andreessen Horowitz, Greylock, all of those people really cut their teeth and started in um, enterprise software. Right? And these have been incredibly massive uh, returning funds investing in incredibly massive companies. Um, and the entire enterprise software market is $450 billion, right? Seems pretty large, like that, that's the, the size of a very large uh, country's GDP. Um, but then you go and look at the overall real estate industry, construction and buildings, um, that's a $266 trillion asset class and about $9 trillion of spend in that market roughly every single year, right? So we're talking two, sometimes three orders of magnitude larger than these other markets uh, that have already been proven that we can make a lot of money in these markets. You need a market where people, A, are willing to change, but where there's B, a lot of low hanging fruit. And I think what we've seen in the built world environment is the entire industry is heavily underinvested here, which is uh, kind of exactly what you said. So there is a lot of low hanging fruit for people to come in um, and provide solutions where the bar isn't so high um, that you need to be, you know, a thousand times better in order for people to start buying your, buying your solutions. Um, the bar is frankly incredibly low because historically the entire industry has heavily under uh, under invested in these technologies um, and so you couple those two things together massive market size 
heavy underinvestments, and then this coming tidal wave of what we were talking about earlier of consumer demands on brands, uh, and those brands are going to turn around and uh, put demands on their landlords, and then regulatory changes coming in. Um, and then frankly, even investors who are investing in all of the REITs that own all of these buildings, right, are also demanding stuff. So you've got this massive pressure from all of the stakeholders on the industry that this industry needs to change. It's a massive industry and it's an industry that's heavily underinvested. And you kind of put those three things together and I think it's a recipe for uh, some massive returns. Obviously, I, I, I totally agree. And, you know, one of the things that I think is so interesting about, you know, today, 2020, is that these kind of almost secular tailwinds have converged, you know, behind the real estate industry, all, all of which you've mentioned, which is consumer demand and enterprise demand, meaning the actual supply demand dynamics for real estate itself is changing because of certain large companies or certain individuals commitments to sustainability and their new recognition that real estate is highly contributive to that. And we're at this also unique inflection, right? We're recording this in, in uh, early December, and we now know the next administration is probably going to be one of the most environmentally progressive administrations in American history and is following, right, probably the most environmentally regressive administration for the last four years. And so the U.S. will be back in the Paris Agreement and carbon neutrality laws will only grow at a local level. The obvious question to me is like, why, why isn't there another vehicle that is specifically mandated to invest in the technology to decarbonize the physical environment? Is this just, it was only possible in 2020? And I guess the related question there, I'm kind of conjoining it with another question is, um, to what extent is that a hangover from the kind of lackluster returns of previous iterations of green tech and clean tech and kind of a sustainability mandate in investing. How much of that is just a legacy of that? Yeah, I think um, in the United States specifically, probably the number one driver of this in, um, in the built world has actually been that energy costs in the US are just so damn cheap right, compared to the rest of the world. And what that really means is that um, if, if I have a building, um, most of my costs go into the CapEx up front to build that building, and then very little of it over the life of that building actually goes into the OPEX that's predominantly energy going into that building. Um, and what's really changing here is that that equation of uh, spend less up front because it doesn't matter. I'm not going to have to worry about um, higher electricity bills or higher gas bills um, for the for the life of the building. That um, equation is really changing here um, because of these outside forces. Right. And it's starting to really change to a point where, um, A, spending more to build a bit, better building in the first place is actually much cheaper over the life of the building because then you can re heavily reduce your OPEX over the life of that building. Um, and that really is starting the built world's industry to start to think about, okay, should we be changing the economics of how we think about these things? Because a building that sits around for 30 years, um, you know, but is burning 30, 40, 50% less energy every single year actually starts to be positive to your bottom line and a positive economic decision for you to make, even to spend a little bit more on that upfront, um, because the regulations and the demands from customers and things like that are really changing here. Um, and so I think for the first time in the last you know, five or six years, we've actually started to see the industry wake up to this fact that a better built building uh, with better efficiency can command higher rents from all the people going into that building um, will cost me less in terms of insurance. It will cost me less in terms of um, operating expenses around electricity and things. Um, and it's really uh, stopping being an ethical question of like, should we do this because we care about the environment and shifting over to an obviously we'll do this because it's good for the bottom line. I don't think you have to be too much of a cynic to see that most of the world works on economic ideas, right, as opposed to ethical ideas. I think an ethical idea, maybe you get uh, one or two percent of forward, forward thinking thought leaders in a space. But when something becomes an economic argument, that's when you rapidly get the entire industry chasing after it. I feel like that subtle shift 
of who's paying the bill. Now, who's paying the regulators is actually driving some of this new focus that we're seeing from real estate owners to invest in the very technologies that can help them reduce their carbon footprint, turn off those lights automatically, and actually take responsibility for the actions of the tenants inside their building. Um, and it's just a really interesting dynamic of how, as you said, the kind of uh, the invisible hand of profit incentive yep. is ultimately the strongest driver in what I think is going to be, you know, one of the biggest creations of enterprise value in our lifetimes, which is investments in climate tech, you know, over the next three decades. When it comes down to it, with a payback period of two to five years, but a life uh, of, you know, 20-ish years on any one of these pieces of equipment inside a building, so take like a more, a more efficient HVAC motor, right? It's going to pay back its upfront cost in two to three years. Um, but then you as the operator of that building or the tenants in that building, get to live with cheaper electricity bills for the next 17 to like 27 years, right? Um, and it's just getting people to think about that other you know, side of the equation as opposed to the upfront costs, that a slight change of, let's put a stick in place with taxes, um, gets people to shift their point of view. But at the end of the day, if you just consume less stuff, your bottom line grows because you are just using less stuff. Right. right. It's just, it's, um, and it's, that just has to be better for business. And it's so interesting that like it was these subtle shifts. I mean, they were th these are trends that were well afoot, you know, before 2020. And I think it's almost just like the spotlight has been shown on the real estate industry, its culpability in the climate crisis and some of these kind of clear financial imperatives of everyone to just use less electricity, either because of capital markets, either because of the demand side of, you know, the supply demand dynamics of, of real estate capital markets um, and real estate occupancy markets, but, but also now these regulators, right? And I don't think anyone thinks of regula regulators as necessarily being super nuanced in, you know, how they, they drive incentives, but I think almost accidentally these new carbon neutrality laws are creating a really nuanced focus now from the real estate industry on decarbonizing. And that's really exciting. And how do you think the, you know, when you look at themes, right, that, that we're going to invest in, how much of that do you think will be inspired by what's already happened and happening in Europe today, right? Europe has been kind of at the vanguard um, of sustainability broadly, but I would say also specifically for the built environment. What do you think we can learn from, from what Europe has done uh, here in the U.S. as I think we're about to enter, certainly in the next four years, one of the biggest retrofitting booms in the history of the world, right? That is, that is, yeah. that is imminent right now. Yeah, I think, I think we, can, we can learn uh, some good things and some bad things from Europe. So the good things we can learn from, from Europe is, is that with the right regulatory environment, you can force the industry to, to go and do things that they potentially didn't want to do before. So, so Europe has, has treated a lot of this um, with a carrot and stick approach, specifically around taxes and regulations. But then the flip side of it is that in Europe, the um, uh, sort of job situation and the cost of labor is significantly higher than it necessarily is in America. And so I think a lot of solutions that maybe are good for Europe don't necessarily make the same economic sense as they do in America because of the fundamental differences in cost of labor in America. Um, and so actually what I'd like to see and what um, we can expect a Biden presidency to, uh, to start looking at is this is a fundamental massive a job creation opportunity. Um, if you think of, hey, we might lose some jobs around coal-fired uh, coal um, uh, electrical plants, but the opportunity to create jobs that are high quality jobs in retrofitting buildings to uh, get them up to code is probably three, maybe four orders of magnitude larger than the total number of jobs you'll ever lose in the coal, uh, in the coal power stations. Um, so I think what we can do that's better than Europe is reframing this as a job creation opportunity because it frankly is massive, right? And I think where a lot of the clean tech industry has focused is on jobs in um, uh, generation. So jobs putting up wind turbines and jobs putting up solar farms. Um, but they've really ignored the fact that actually where the rubber meets the road, all of these technologies need to be retrofitted into buildings, you know, the, the better efficiency motors, the better windows, um, you know, all of these unsexy solutions that I've, that I've discussed, uh, you need humans to go and install them. And there's another obvious point, which is that 
you know, when you think about ins installing a new wind farm or a new solar farm, there's probably not labor right nearby. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas when you think about where the buildings are, that's where the labor is, right? So the yeah. labor, the labor that we want to enfranchise in retrofitting these assets are definitionally where those assets are. And I think, again, it's one of those kind of, um, it's almost so obvious that it's hiding in plain sight, this opportunity to um, drive employment and deploy technologies through retrofitting of the existing building stock, you know, the numbers around which are just staggering, right? They're, they're truly staggering yeah. in terms of the employment potential, but also the spend potential, you know, on a lot of the low hanging fruit technologies, but a lot of um, kind of the new technologies that we plan to invest in. Um, yeah. Anyway, well, yeah. If, if I was a if I was a betting man here, um, I, and I wasn't just betting in the technologies themselves, which is what we're investing in. Um, if I was a private equity investor right now, if I was just a, an entrepreneur looking for an interesting um, business to start, starting or acquiring companies that do retrofits of all of these sorts of technologies, I think is going to be one of the fastest growing industries over the next twenty years. Um, you know. I could see it rivaling the growth of the software industry or the internet, right? Just because of the massive uplift of work that needs to happen here. So um, as much as we are going to be investing in the technologies themselves, getting a whole other ecosystem of people investing in the businesses that will go and install those companies is also going to be a, another massive pile of money um, that someone should be making. Yeah, well... More to chew on, obviously, around yeah. this, this uh, massive opportunity at kind of the intersection of sustainability and the built environment. Um, well, Greg, as, as always, it's so interesting getting your thoughts on, you know, all of these subjects. So thanks so much for, for sharing them. Yeah, it's been great. And it's uh, great to join the team. Very excited for what we're going to do here. We're thrilled to have you. Awesome. Thanks, Greg. <laughs>